Hi, everyone. So good morning. Um, my role this morning is to introduce today's speakers who will share advances in scenic AI resource known as Scenic Air. The, that's the California uh, portion of the National Research Platform. I'll start with my colleague here, Chris. Chris Bruton is a network architect at Scenic who came to us from Caltech, from our community. He supports high performance networking and computing for our members with a focus on projects like Fabric and the National Research Platform and Sense Autogol. He also just happens to be a geophysicist who knows a thing or two about earthquakes. So feel free to ask him all about it on your, on your free time. <laughs> So um, the feature speaker for today in many aspects needs no introduction. Larry Smarr is the godfather of innovation when it comes to what's possible in networking and advanced computing. He's an expert at developing an offer none of us can refuse when it comes to a new idea that derives from his curiosity and it in inevitably leads to breakthroughs in both access and impact for end users. Those of us who have worked with and around Scenic for more than a few years, know how much we owe Larry, uh, know how much we owe to the serendipity that brought Larry Smart from the winters of Illinois to the relative warmth of San Diego. He is arguably the reason that this country's universities got access to the power and potential of supercomputing centers when we did in the early 1980s. And then with his remarkable band of brothers in networking, he led the development of the Pacific Research Platform and now uh, which led to the National Research Platform and now the Scenic AI resource that is designed to enable both research and the education community members to contribute to the evolving big data fueled AI e ecosystem while learning from it. Gentlemen, I look forward to learning from you, from both of you. Larry. Well, it's really uh, great to be here. <clears throat> uh, as you know, I love the scenic community. Uh, I've been involved with uh, the board, I guess, for over 20 years. The reason that we're talking today is that we're at a historic turning point. We've been here before. We've seen how this works with the Apollo program in the 60s. Uh, there it was. Russia that we were concerned about as competition. Then uh, in the mid eighties with supercomputers, it was Japan and Germany we were worried about. Um, there was the rise, explosive rise of the web in the late nineties, early two thousands. And now with AI and ML, we're seeing the same thing. And again, we have China that we're worried about, but many other countries as well. You know, it helps if you've lived long enough to see the movie a few times because you know what's coming. And that's what I'm here to tell you about. Uh, it's really pretty well, the script's already out there. Um, these are just headlines that I clipped. This is uh, from uh, just uh, last month from Euronews. There's a, a growing realization that there is a huge skill shortage of people trained in AI and ML. There's a notion that the universities are the place that have to ramp up quickly to get curriculum in place so that we can increase the uh, AI ML workforce, not in five years, not in 10 years, but in one or two years, which means you've got to move at a speed that is very different than what you're used to. The White House understood this about two years ago, put together a call for a top level expert task force uh, to create what became known as the National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource and their task force. That task force included people we know like Mike Norman, that the DIN director of SDSC, uh, they were produced this report. So this is about one year ago, January 23, strengthening and democratizing the US AI innovation ecosystem. You know, bringing together computational resources, data, test beds, algorithms, software, services, and networks and expertise that would help democratize 
So the NSF is really keen on this because this report suggests that $2.6 billion be added to the NSF budget. Now that has not been appropriated yet. But this is a call from the White House and from the Congress to get it done. Just uh, January, the NSF announced that they are launching a pilot for this uh, national AI research resource. And literally last week at the Qualcomm Institute, Ramesh Rao, the director, is here with us and on the board of Scenic, uh, we had Katie Antipas, who is the director of the NSF Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, which has the lead for this. And she gave the keynote to our fifth national research platform uh, meeting, talking about the development of the pilot, which is being announced. And in fact, uh, contributions of compute and storage and, and, and software are already being added both by universities and by industry to this. And this will kick off the whole NAIR. Now, as I say, if you've lived through a few of these things, you realize that what happens is there's a federal call, but then there are states that understand where this is going and take leadership. And that's where I think California is very positioned to do so. And I'll tell you that one of the two reasons for that is the pre-existence of Scenic, connecting all of the higher education uh, entities uh, in, the, in, the, in the state and those that hierarchy of educations from the privates and the UCs to the Cal States, to the community colleges, the K through 12, the libraries, the nonprofits that we heard about earlier, there is nowhere in the world that both has that verticality of capability and education and research in one state. There's not another state, there's not another country. And that's because of Scenic. If it wasn't for Scenic, that wouldn't be the case. You wouldn't have all these groups having talked to each other for 20 years. So how do we get to where we are with the National Research Platform, which I think is a vehicle that we can ride um, forward on? Well, it goes back actually almost over almost 25 years to uh, a set of grants <clears throat> that actually were the Optiputer <clears throat> became possible because of a similar task force that I was on for President Clinton that asked for the NSF to get an extra billion a year for large scale uh, computer science and engineering test bids. <clears throat> and then there was competition, the Optiputer, which at that time, people didn't believe that the wide area network could ever be as fast as the back plane of the clusters they were connecting. The Optiputer, did the research to show that that was wrong. We didn't know where, what kind of switching we were gonna need and, and this sort of thing. So there was another grant called Quartzsite, Phil Papadopoulos at SDSC was the PI of that, I was co-PI. Uh, and then we used the campus as a test bed. But Prism uh, and a number of these others hooking together many different uh, application centers, research centers, uh, with optical networks uh, to show that you could actually begin to make a uniform fabric. So the Department of Energy, Ender, uh, Manga was here uh, yesterday, and um, they, and uh, as they watched all of this, they realized that something had to happen on the campuses. And so they coined something called the Science DMZ, Demilitarized Zone, that had a separate network architecture from the commodity traffic um, that was for the researchers and the big data flows like Harvey Newman and all of the people that are, are, are not a typical um, commodity internet. Now, we make the most progress in this country <clears throat> when the Department of Energy and NSF partner up and it doesn't happen but every few decades, <laughs> but when it does, you have to stand back because the NSF liked this idea so much that Kevin Thompson, who's uh, who was at our five NRP last uh, last week, uh, who has developed this whole campus cyber infrastructure program, uh, set up an, an ability for campuses to put in um, proposals to get 
uh, DMZs uh, on their campus and other uh, kinds of things. They've made over 385 awards. The country is full of campuses across the world, across the country, in EPSCOR states, MSIs, um, minority serving institutions, uh, R1s, et cetera. Uh, and so that program started in 2012. Well, as I watched that develop, and I was very involved, I was heading the uh, NSF Advisory Committee on Cyber Infrastructure, I realized that the next logical step was to hook them all together. So think of those um, science DMZs as the freeway systems inside of cities like Los Angeles and Chicago and so forth, and the interstate highway system being what connects those uh, freeways. And so we set up this idea of using, because California was pre-organized with the scenic backbone with all of these research educations all the blue ones had already received federal cyber infrastructure grants and so we were able to hook up their dmz's um we added a number in the green that that weren't and notice that there are three supercomputers centers uh nasa ames lawrence berkeley and and sdsc as well uh, and so this group, we put together Tom Defani, uh, Frank Wertheim, who uh, now, of course, runs SDSC, was a co-PI. Tom was a co-PI, Phil, and, and Camille at Berkeley. Uh, and this grant uh, has lasted actually from <clears throat> uh, 2015 through 2022, so seven years. Now, as we were doing that, AI, you know, has been around machine learning. Neural nets go back at least in the university development to the 70s. And, and you were, you know, UCSD was actually one of the major places where a lot of the current leaders came from. But what is realized is that graphical processing units, which were set up to get graphics on your screen very fast, turned out to have the right architecture for dramatically speeding up AI computations. And so that's why there is this gold rush now on GPUs and why NVIDIA has become a $2 trillion market cap company. Um, so we put in another proposal, and Tom Defani, again, was instrumental in understanding the need. As a computer scientist, he understood that we had to go to a lot of the different campuses and get their computer scientist to say, you know, we don't normally use computational infrastructure, but we need to have lots of GPUs and we only got one under our desk. So could how, what would you do in computer science architecture and algorithm development if, if you had that? And we put this proposal together uh, that brought in 256 GPUs for 30 faculty and, and 10 campuses. Um, and that was the thing that really set it all off. Now, we developed at UCSD this idea of, well, how do you package this up? You use PCs. The reason you always use PCs is because they are being driven by hundreds of millions of people buying them. <laughs> Supercomputers are like hundreds of people. <laughs> That's a million to one advantage if you use commodity technology. And you can put eight of these gaming GPUs, these 32-bit GPUs, which are actually what you want for most machine learning because the data doesn't have double precision. So you put eight of those, you rack mount them. So it's very convenient. And then you put 10, 40, 100 gigabit network interface cards on them so that you can take the optical network flow and you put solid state uh, disk, you know, five or six terabytes in line with that to then drop it to the say several hundred terabyte rotating disk. And so these Fiona's, these flexible flash IO for flash memory um, network appliances became the unit that we could then start deploying. And again, it couldn't have happened if it wasn't for Scenic having been there and the campus is connected. So this is Jeff when he was at Merced <laughs> and a lot of the others, We Tom just, Put a bunch of them in the, you know, because he's a, you know, he and I are 60s guys. You know, so he, he got his van and put a whole bunch of them. And then we drove around, you know, deploying them. It's sort of like, you know, anyway, back in the day. Um, 
these were all installed and then immediately hooked up because Scenic was already hooking up the campus. Duh. You know, that's how we knew it was going to work. But the neat thing about it is that we then put another proposal in called the Toward the National Research Platform. Uh, and this used the pre-existing quilt map. Now, I put that up there for a reason. This goes back to the NSF net when it first started. The next step after the 56 kilobit per second, you know, kilobit backbone of NSF net was to fund the regionals. And they put in proposals to make the regionals. Well, guess what? The footprint of that from the mid 80s is still there. And those are the regional optical networks and they're all interconnected, of course, by uh, internet too. And Howard, of course, is, is here uh, and is uh, essential to that entire operation as is Jen Leisure, who's the president of the quilt and who was speaking last week at 5NRP. So this is the original Pacific Research Platform built around Scenic. We also reached out to the Front Range Gigapop, to MREN in Chicago, and the Pacific Northwest Gigapop, which of course is the Pacific Wave partner of Scenic. And what this uh, new grant funded, two and a half million dollars to build out to other regional networks. And we chose the Great Plains Network, Learn in Texas, uh, and then Kinber and uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and those then gave us a ability to get across the entire country. Uh, then Frank Wertheim led uh, a proposal that I was not on. Tom, of course, was on it uh, as a very key person in any of these. And this set up a prototype of the national research platform that the NSF funded across the country, which developed a lot more uh, computational capability. So last year uh, at the fourth national research platform, um, the national research platform was uh, said to exist. Frank took over the leadership for me of the PRP. He's the leader of the national research platform. Uh, and this is essentially the culmination, as I've shown you, of 22 straight years of NSF funding. So we wouldn't be here. And that's when you think about the NSF getting ready to fund NAIR, it's a continuation of several decades without which we wouldn't be here doing this. Well, how does it work? Well, fundamentally, you connect all of those with optical networks, all of those Fiona's, 200 of them on say 27 different campuses. So a completely distributed system. And we have now nearly 1,300 GPUs, nearly uh, 21,000 CPU cores, and uh, at least uh, seven terabyte, uh, petabytes of rotating storage uh, distributed across Scenic, the Quilt, and Internet2, as I mentioned. Many of these came from <clears throat> campuses who had professors who got grants to buy GPUs and so forth. And instead of sticking them in their lab and locking it, they said, well, if we add these to the NRP, you can guarantee we get all the cycles in our cluster, but then we can go out and get more cluster, more, more cycles, right? What a deal. And so that's why it has become a community owned and operated AI resource. Now, <clears throat> the thing that really made it take off was that Google had developed the ability, it, you know, Google sitting there and, and there's like, I don't know, a billion searches a day or something. You, it had to be a completely automated system. So they containerized each of their software requests to go across the global set of connected, optically connected PCs, essentially like what we've done to build an academic cloud. It's their cloud, right? And so we just adopted Kubernetes because it was open source. And then it's, Rook and uh, is a, a uh, to operate on Ceph for storage sits under Kubernetes, and so that gave us an ability to both handle the data and then send out software containers to uh, use it. And as John Graham, who's one of our key technical, probably you know one of the most important people for having made this happen, uh, as he says, we can now manage petabytes of distributed storage and GPUs for data science while we're measuring and monitoring the network use. So the reason that we came up with this notion of scenic air is we noticed that 
actually a large fraction of the resource sits in California on the campuses of Scenic Connected members. And here, a beautiful uh, graphic from Hunter Hathaway at, at Scenic. Uh, uh, those show the number in black of GPUs, the number of CPU cores in gray, and the number of petabytes, uh, terabytes in, in yellow. And you add it all up to almost 10,000 GPU, CPU cores here. Half of the national uh, amount are in California. And eight out of 1,300 uh, GPUs are here. And more than half the storage. And it's growing all the time. So <clears throat> not only does that mean that you can, as an institution, and that if you have a user, a faculty or a student, all you have to do is authenticate and log on, and you can use uh, this resource. But it's better than that because then you can burst out across from the uh, scenic uh, piece that we call scenic air now, the AI resource. You can then, when you over, you need more, you can go out to, for instance, our minority serving institutions and and that that host these things to EPSCOR, the 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 half of the states that get the least NSF funding um, and the uh, uh, non MSI institutions as well. So all of those that shows the number of GPUs and the regional optical network that's connecting them. So you burst into this much larger group and you'd say, well, what about the cloud? Well, here is the beauty of it. Once you've taken your application and you've uh, containerized it so it can be run under Nautilus, guess what? You're using exactly what all the cloud providers have adopted, which is Kubernetes. And so you can run in the commercial cloud just the same as you run on the NRP. And in fact, the work you do this is all under the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Once you've, uh, you, once you've gone into Nautilus, the NRP's uh, infrastructure, with your containers, you're cloud ready. So you can go from that straight into the cloud if you have resources, either money or credits in the cloud. So there's multiple levels that you can go beyond your local resources. Now, how do you get going on this? Because I know that's what we get asked a lot. Well, just go to the NRP, see up in the uh, nationalresearchplatform.org <clears throat> or nrp.ai works as well. Okay, and then go over and see where it says join contact over there on the right, click on it. Okay. So you can, you can contact or join the mailing list, or you just go right down to the bottom of that page. You've got all the analysis documentation, getting started with Nautilus, and the matrix chat, which is essentially the community of users who form an online consulting group with over a thousand members. So when you have a problem, you just ask matrix, you know, who, who can help me with this? And whoever's knows in the, whole country just boom right so it's 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 a it's a whole democratization of what normally is a very limited pool of people who can do consulting well who's using this the scenic air uh, these are the campuses who in the last six months have actually had users that have logged on and used it and you can see that it's a mix of the UC um, the Cal states and the private universities let me go in a little more detail on that because I think the the you know the future really here is in the California State University system. That's because they produce something like over half of the you know bachelor's degrees in, in the in the state. Um, they're spread out of twenty three of them. Um, and so I did a lot of research on the databases of who's using the NRP. And what I found was that over half of the CSU campuses already have somebody who's logged on or many people who've logged on up to 73 at San Diego State have registered, logged on with CI log on with your, your authentication uh, and uh, are ready to go. So. I was sort of shocked because at the scenic retreat last July, there were uh, eight campuses. There's now 12 campuses six months later. And if you'll notice how many of, of the uh, across the top are just coming in now. 
there's 173 individuals in the CSU system across the campuses who have already registered. And this is the next thing you do besides register is you join or make a project called a namespace. And five of the 23 campuses have already done that. And that numbers tell you the number of namespaces that each of those campuses have either joined or, or created. There's 57 of these projects already active in, in the CSU system. And the ones that have actually gone on and used GPUs or CPUs, four of those campuses, San Bernardino is the lead, San Diego State right behind them, uh, and then Northridge and Humboldt. So this is in the last six months, people have actually from those campuses gone out. And that's the number uh, of uh, projects that have been activated on each of those campuses. So 35 active meeting, actually using resources, not just registering. Um, and all of those people can help you get on because they've already done it. Notice, have they made any use of this? Well, over a million CPU core hours in six months, almost 50,000 GPU hours. I remind you there's about, as an astrophysicist, I can tell you there's about 8,000 hours in a year. So if you use 50,000, you have to have used multiple GPUs 24 seven to get that much. That's a lot of time. Now here, just let me give you an example. Bing Bing Lee is a professor at, at Cal State Northridge. And this is, a, it's a lot of stuff, but these are all different projects that Bing Bing has going. And notice he's using deep neural networks. He's using graph neural networks. He's using PyTorch. He's using TensorFlow. He's using large language models like ChatGPT, Llama. He's, you know, this is one researcher at Cal State Northridge. And he gave a talk about his work at the meeting of the NRP last week. Now, San Bernardino uh, has done just an extraordinary job of setting up what they call a high performance computing program. But what it is, is they actually use Jupyter, which is the electronic notebooks like the web that are on the web, eventually uh, uh, up through different kinds of projects. And as a result of creating from faculty down to to, to staff all integrated together of people who are already on the campus, they got enough of their users to use the NRP that they have used at their campus in San Bernardino, more GPU time in the last year than eight of the 10 UC campuses. This is the potential that the CSUs have. Um, and one of the reasons they did it was because they use Jupyter. Jupyter is electronic notebook, it's just, like the web, it has a URL, just like a web page would. So instead of a cat video, you know, you give a Jupyter Notebook URL to your friends, and then they can execute the software live. They can go in and change the program, put their own data in. And so it just goes like crazy, it's like wildfire. How many? Well, last summer was 150 users at San Bernardino use this to get on the NRP. It's tripled in the last five, in the last six months. Now, you are all very fortunate to be able to, at 2.10 uh, two this afternoon in the ballroom, to hear the team from San Bernardino tell you how they did it and how they can help you get on and do it. All of you who are from a university or helping a university who want to understand how to get with this program, be at that session. SDSU, as I said, is the other CSU that's really led. And we heard yesterday from Jerry Sheehan, and a whole panel up here on their new uh, technology infrastructure for data exploration, tied NSF grant. Notice all the CSUs that are tied together by Scenic with San Diego Supercomputer Center, Mary Thomas, who we heard from who's doing, done so many years of, of training and is developing modules for all of this. Um, and this is $800,000 for a new computational core that will sit in the SDSU uh, machine room, but be able to be used to across the CSU system for these initial campuses and hopefully many others. And they have 
money for students, um, and that's not $800, that's $800,000 uh, and $200,000 for students. And this system is federated with Nautilus. And so this is really the first new NSF uh, resource that is uh, come onto the scenic air. Uh, as a result, as I'm going to co-host with Sylvie the award luncheon today, you will see that one of the awards is going to be to this team for this dramatic, uh, this dramatic grant that is going to change a lot. So, how do we build? You know, when there is a the the country, the White House, the Congress decides there's a crisis, and they ask the country to respond and to increase the workforce. Remember. If, any of you are old enough to remember the 60s and what that did to led to like several hundred thousand people working on the Apollo program in a year or two. You know, what we did during World War II in terms of building planes, building ships, that's the time. That's what we're in right now. How do we get there fast? Not five years, not 10 years, the next year or two. It's got to be accelerated. And so the way to do that is to get into the existing course structure of the universities all across the UCs, the privates, the, the Cal States. And I think the community colleges in particular are going to be critical for this workforce development. And to give you an example of how quick this can go, UC San Diego, of course, that's where was the you know th whole thing was born. They said, well, let's just adopt a rack of these things, put them in the San Diego Supercomputer Center, and then tell all the people on our campus that are teaching courses, it's available for your students to use in your courses. Well, this, all of this is totally modern. This is exactly what they'll use when they go into industry with those jobs, except they'll get an extra zero on their salary as a result of having done this. Um, it's student focused, um, it's, it's research driven, and it's managed by the uh, IT group at UCSD, this bar chart is from the fall of 17 through the winter of 24, the quarters. And that's the number of courses. Look at all the different divisions, arts and humanities, marine science, physical science, biological science, data science, social science, engineering, extended studies, across the whole campus, they're just using the existing network on the campus to get to this resource. And how many students? 6,000 students in one quarter, 6,000 in one quarter. And before they didn't have access to computing at all. Okay, you could do this on every one of your campuses. And there's an example of just the breadth of the courses that are offered, you know, numerical analysis, robot manipulation, data analysis, bioinformatics. But wouldn't it be cool if that had been federated, which it couldn't be because of the way the monies are handled at UCSD, you have to separate student and research. So Jerry Sheehan at, at, uh, and Mike Farley at, at San Diego uh, State said, well, let's try that for San Diego State. So they put in this rack. Uh, they are now in the spring quarter have 14 courses and 300 students. Um, and they are, uh, then that is a model for the whole system. Now with Tide, you can use that for courses as well. Again, from San Diego State, whose machine room is now essentially available to all the SDSUs. You don't need a machine room on your campus, thanks to Scenic. So how does your campus get involved through Scenic? I've asked Chris Bruton, the Scenic network architect to come up and give a short presentation that he gave for the first time last week at the fifth national research platform conference. And so he's going to show you some very innovative approaches that scenic uh, engineering team are using to respond to this. Um, so all of your institutions should be joining in on this. You have to move quickly. That's the national moment we're in. And um, I'll be happy to answer questions after I first have Chris come up and tell you a little bit more about what Scenic is doing to make it possible for you to be part of this.
Hi. Thanks, uh, thanks, Larry, for uh, inviting me to to uh, take the last part of your talk. So, I'm Christopher Bruton. I'm a network architect at Scenic. Um, I'll be talking about Scenic Air and several of the Science DMZ models that Scenic's offering to our members. Sorry, can we get the slides on the? Thank you. Okay. So, oh, how do I go back? There we go. So I just wanted to also acknowledge Robert Kwan, who's our VP of Engineering, and of course Tom DeFonti, who's uh, who's also helping us out with uh, with Scenic Air. So they both helped me out with uh, with the presentation. There it is. So I think most of us have an idea of the Science DMZ concept, but I wanted to define how we understand it at Scenic. So NRP nodes and other high performance computing applications, they require high performance networking access. This often can't be satisfied effectively by campus enterprise networks, uh, which are designed to provide internet access to campus users, but not optimized for high throughput and low latency. Um, every device between the edge and the end user has the opportunity to introduce latency, congestion and firewall restrictions and can make troubleshooting much more challenging. So the Science DMZ model, this addresses this problem by bypassing as much of the campus infrastructure as possible. So the goal is to place the computing infrastructure as close as possible to the network edge and the scenic backbone. So I'm going to discuss two science DMZ models that we already see at Scenic member campuses and two more models that we are newly offering as part of Scenic Air. So option one, we call this a virtual science DMZ. This doesn't require any new physical infrastructure between the campus and the Scenic Edge and might be the fastest way to build a new science DMZ at a campus. This makes use of the existing physical connection between the campus border and the scenic CPE. Um, we provision a special VLAN for the Science DMZ. This is a direct layer two connection to our HPR network, which is a dedicated high performance segment of CalREN. The campus is still responsible for their own routing and switching and any physical infrastructure between the campus border and the computing infrastructure. So option two, this is the physical science DMZ. Uh, we have two sub options. So option 2A, which is here, this is a dedicated physical connection from the scenic CPE to the campus border router. This is in addition to an existing physical connection used for the, the campus enterprise. This provides dedicated bandwidth to the CPE, which can improve networking performance compared to a VLAN. But this is still, of course, limited to the overall, limited by the overall capacity to CalRen. We do have some campuses who combine this approach with an additional optical circuit to a scenic hub site, which may be dedicated to the, the science DMZ. Option 2B, option 2B, also the physical science DMZ. Um, in this case, instead of a second connection to the same campus border router, then the campus sets up a dedicated switch or router for their, their science DMZ. So in this model, the campus still owns and operates the science DMZ border device, but there, there may be advantages in separating completely from the main campus border router. So the Science DMZ, it could use a dedicated device with better performance than the main campus, maybe faster interfaces, deeper buffers, um, that kind of thing. This could also satisfy the campus IT groups who don't want experimental network usage on their main router or don't want to deal with support calls from, uh, from us uh, high performance computing users. So um, those are the two options. So a bit of an interlude. So Larry talked a lot about Scenic Air already. You may have attended his and Tom's session yesterday as well. At the very surface level, the Scenic AI resource is simply a new branding for the California portion of the NRP. But what this, what this represents is Scenic's commitment as an active participant in the NRP project, uh, beyond just being a hands-off network provider. 
We're committed to providing design and engineering support to campuses to establish their science DMZs and facilitate access to the national research platform. So with that in mind, I'm going to present two more science DMZ models that, that reflect this active approach. So option three, still in development, but this is geared towards campuses that can't host their own physical NRP nodes. So for example, lack of space and power, funding or staff to maintain the nodes, but they still want to support education and research projects that need easy access to the NRP. So this, this approach is say extent. This approach essentially extends a science DMZ from one campus to another over the scenic backbone. So this provides a direct layer two link through scenic's backbone um, for the science DMZ. And in, in this diagram, I show from a computing lab, I mean, it could be, you know, we'd work with the campus on the specific need, but this is just an example of, of what this might be used for. And then finally, we have option four. We're calling this the managed science DMZ. This is perhaps the most radical new model that Scenic is offering because traditionally we've been fairly hands-off beyond the Scenic edge. So in this model, Scenic will provide and actively manage a science DMZ device on the campus. And this of course includes 24 seven production level support from the Scenic NOC. Um, the campus would simply simply or not simply, but they just need to connect their NRP nodes to the, the switch or, or router that Scenic provides, configure IP addresses, default gateways. Scenic will take care of the rest, the routing and the switching, providing simplified access to Caloran HPR network as well as the internet. Um, this is still a pilot project, so I'll mention that we're currently only offering this for Scenic air use cases. And that is for NRP nodes located at Scenic member campuses. But we, we still encourage you to talk to us if you have other research needs that could benefit from this model. So I, I had this slide at the start of the deck when I gave this talk last week at the NRP workshop. I, I used this to explain what Scenic is, how we operate CalREN to serve the R&D community, I hope everyone here already knows what Scenic is, um, but I still wanted to highlight this quote from our homepage, which describes Scenic's mission in a single sentence. So Scenic connects California to the world and Scenic Air is our explicit affirmation of the importance of machine learning and AI to today's research and education community. And Scenic Air is our explicit commitment to support high performance computing as part of our mission. So thank you. Feel free to contact any of us. And, uh, and if you have questions for either of us, we can uh, take them now. Yeah, we'll so. stand up here and see what the questions are. So what about some questions? And I can't see any of you because of lights. <laughs> bunch of shy people. <laughs> it's curious, could you speak to any of the energy consumption considerations? So like if power is cheaper in Texas than it is California, does that burstability uh, factor into that in any way? Uh, well, that's a really interesting question. Of course, the GPUs are power hogs and electrical, both the Durham and Coulomb. Um, it is a limiting factor and that's why uh, what Chris just told you in California is so important, because many of the campuses that are scenic connected don't have the uh, computer space that has the power and the cooling to put a bunch of GPUs, and yet their faculty and students desperately need to get them. And so that's why the ability to just go out through the pre-existing campus network and scenic to where all of them live in the national research platform uh, can save you from not not being able to do that on your campus, and yet your faculty and students can still get access. As far as the, you know, it's not like the companies that are buying semi trucks of H one hundreds and need a small nuclear reactor to you know run these things. Um, they're a rack, you know. I mean, any machine room has racks, and so it's a piece of a rack. 
that would typically be on a campus. So I don't think that the power across the country differences uh, really make any substantial difference. Harvey? Harvey Newman, Caltech. I wanted to emphasize that, although this was a wonderful talk today, that CNIC also has been a unique partner in partnering at the frontiers of networking for science. And our campus, Caltech, is a place where that has really come forward, and also our partnership with UCSD in this. So we're moving not only towards 400 gig networking, but multiple 400 gig connections. This is strongly supported by Scenic and by Chris in particular. And I think it opens the way to addressing the largest, most challenging um, needs of data intensive science programs, like, but not only the Large Hadron Collider. And I think we couldn't really frame our future requirements and satisfy them without Scenic and UCSD's help. Thank you, Harvey. And, you know, Harvey has been, <laughs> for decades, um, one of the most critical global leaders in advancing networking technology to support massive data-driven science. Of course, he's an outstanding member of the Large Hadron Collider community, but he has gone way beyond that and helped drive <clears throat> global networks to now 400 and, you know, actually in the next few years to terabit uh, per second networks that are going to be required by some of the very large uh, global instruments. Um, but this interaction between uh, Frank Wertheim's group, for instance, at UCSD and particle physics and Harvey's group at Caltech, that has been a real test bed uh, of a lot of the innovations that we then push out more generally across uh, this. So I'm really happy that Harvey mentioned that because that interaction with Harvey's group at Caltech has been uh, one of our tight loops in innovation uh, for uh, the PRP and then the NRP. Next. This is for Chris. Um, could you elaborate a little more about option four, a managed science uh, DMZ? Uh, is there a cost involved and in agreement between the campus and the Phoenix? You know, a little detail. Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, this is still an option that's in development and we haven't worked out exact pricing yet. Um, you probably know Scenic's cost model is generally pass, pass through costs to the associates without really a, a markup. So I, I can't really give any numbers right now, but uh, you can work with us and our um, your scenic contacts or reach out to us and we can start developing a solution. I think even though this is presented kind of as a ready-made solution, you know, there's still going to be customizations and, and needs for the, the specific campus. So um, that's uh, that's about all I can say, but you can definitely so reach out. Chris, to one of the things I think uh, it would be great to hear you talk about is, you know, with TIDE, uh, we have an NSF grant now that allows to tie together a, a number of the CSU campuses with Scenic. Um, and I know just from talking to, to you and, and the rest of the technical team that um, that means those campuses could be uh, test beds for pilots of trying these different things. And, and, and so I think that's the way it's really interesting. You know, so much of scenic isn't that scenic gets an NSF grant. It's a faculty at a scenic connected campus that gets a grant that makes use of the fact that scenic is there for in particular data intensive science or education. Uh, so I think it's sort of ready made that we have a subset of the scenic folks that are sort of forward leaning uh, volunteers. What, could you talk a little bit about the th thinking and the engineering team on that? Hmm. Uh, I think uh, 
I think we, I mean, we can go back to option two, option one, option two. I've only been at Scenic for the past year and a half or so. So many of these existing science DMZs at, at campuses like uh, SDSU and UCSD, I mean, they predate me and they were really developed as maybe more a, a bespoke solution for, for the campus. So I, I think we've found there is a demand for these more ready-made models. And I think that's what our engineering team has been working on in the in the past few months, particularly. Um, I mean, me, but also Robert and, and Tony and, and other engineers in our in our group have put together these these models, which reflect actual um I mean, in a in a way, requests, demands from from campuses for for easier access. And I, I think in the next few months we probably will flesh out pricing and and more specifics on option three and four uh, specifically and you know that can help with budgeting for for future grants and um and can kind of help uh with what uh what larry mentioned well you know having been on the scenic board for two decades and having been through so many of the discussions one of the things that i find just fascinating about the scenic social ecosystem um, is that it allows for experimentation of a subset of the community and then everybody else is watching and learning from that and then as they get more comfortable with it and as the technology develops and the things like the pricing comes in and so forth um, the ones who are the guinea pigs talk about it at things like the annual scenic retreat in july uh, in Santa Rosa or in the scenic meetings like here. And so the word sort of percolates up and then before long, so, okay, I'm ready now, I'm ready now. And that's how it sort of, pin it, it, this is a fabulous uh, feature of scenic. Uh, it's not documented on the on the webpage yet, Leon, you could do that. But I, <laughs> but I just observe it happening over and over again. And that means that we we are very hopeful that, there will be a few of the forward-leaning community colleges who want to say, well, could we work on common AIML uh, curriculum, you know, with CSU, with the UCs? Because there's, you know, the UCs are sitting there with, I don't know, 25% or 30% transfer students. And when the students come in from the CSUs and community colleges, we want to make sure that there's as much commonality in, in this so we don't have to retrain them when, when they get there. That scenic could be the ideal place to convene some discussions, to get something going as pilots. And that we have to do. We can't sit back. This isn't a normal moment in history. We have got to do something abnormal. And Scenic allows for us to do that in a very creative way, I think. Next question, Ramesh. Yes, uh, every time I hear the talk, it's very energizing, especially putting such a high performance infrastructure in the hands of just about any user at any of our institutions. But one of the things I've learned from watching how people have used in particular cloud-based services is, you know, people spin up more than they actually need. Right, right. So you have a relatively naive user, student, you know, who locks up more resources than they need to. So is Scenic thinking of not only enabling the people to burst up, but also kind of pull back down, uh, so they're not tying up resources unnecessarily? Right. And what what Ramesh is saying is really interesting because at the first we hadn't completely understood how critical the adoption of the open source Kubernetes from the cloud vendors, from Google, and then it was you know, Azure and, 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 and the rest of them uh, accepted it as a way to orchestrate containers. But what it meant was when we adopted that in the NRP, when you containerize your application and you throw it out into the NRP, you are now ready to go into the cloud, but you're not paying for your learning period in the cloud. So this is like training wheels for the cloud. And yet it's free because your tax money through the federal government 
has already paid for it. The, the contributions that you make to the existence of Scenic has already paid for it. It's already here. You just have to use it, as Leanne Weber likes to say. Next. Good morning. Um, very interesting concept, especially on option four. Do you see the opportunity as it relates to a science DMZ? Um, I, I kind of like to look at the possibility of an arts DMZ in terms of the need for, um, for high capacity um, transfers between sites. Do you see an opportunity to, to push this down a little further so the public schools and the public libraries get to participate in, in um, integration and collaboration along uh, this line? Absolutely, Mont. I mean, what, what, you know, I'm very excited. I don't. When my uh, two boys were in high school, in K through 12, Java, developed as a cross-platform Mac, Unix, Windows uh, programming language. They were in high school. The high school couldn't get teachers who could learn how to do Java and teach the kids. The kids learned it on the street. They learned it from each other. They would go down our basement and, and hack on workstations and, and actually write a lot of Java code that got used widely uh, later. And so you're seeing that today. The kids in high school, the, the people in the community college, they are they are using GPT. They're 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 out there, you know, experimenting with PyTorch. They are using Python. And so uh, I think the public libraries, as long as we can handle the user authentication uh, properly, then. Uh, they can be a real conduit. I think a lot of the some of the advanced K through 12s that want to get their students working on this could do projects. They could partner with, you know, the neat thing about California is it's regionally organized so that there are K through 12s and community colleges and Cal States, you know, that are sort of work with each other in a, in, in a regional decentralized regional fashion. So I really encourage you all to think about that. Those of us at Scenic and 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 on the NRP would love to have pilots in uh, K through 12, the libraries, the community colleges, uh, just like we have with the Cal States. I mean, we've adopted the Cal State system probably 18 months ago. Um, we work with Ed Clark, who's a CIO, uh, and and his team, as well as as the uh, individual campuses, like you're going to hear this afternoon from San Bernardino. It's been a fabulous success, and it's been a great experience for us. So any of you who are interested, please come up to me or Tom Defani or any of the others that are involved in this and just say, hey, how could we get involved? Because it starts with the willing. It starts with the ones who realize this is the moment, and I want to do my part. So I'm stepping forward. Any other questions? Okay, let's call it a wrap.